George P. Harbison is a senior finance executive, having held the position of chief financial officers for several companies in the hospitality and higher education industries over the past 25 years. Over the course of his career, he has managed to buy, he has managed buy sell, and side sell business transactions totaling over $600 million. In 2016, he created and delivered a presentation titled The Victims of Socialism at the University of California, Riverside, and his presentation was subsequently delivered at universities across the nation. His lectures on this topic have been co-sponsored by YAF and the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. Mr. Harbison resides in Mission Viejo, California, where he serves as the on-field announcer of the games played by the Miracle League of Orange County, a baseball league for special needs children and young adults. Please join me in welcoming George Harbison. Thank you, Brianna. And I want to thank YAF as well for inviting me to speak today and uh, speak to you folks. It is customary for speakers to inject a bit of levity at the beginning of their lectures in order to connect with their audiences. However, this approach is not appropriate this afternoon, as there is absolutely nothing humorous about the topic I'm going to speak to you about. So I'll forego any attempt at humor and jump right into the presentation. This lecture has been presented at almost a dozen colleges and universities over the past three years. In Marxist theory, Socialism is a transitional phase between the overthrow of capitalism, which is freedom, and the realization of communism, which is a class-free, state-free utopia. Socialism, as the ideological agent of this transition, relies on a totalitarian, authoritative state to actualize forced economic equality, the elimination of private property, total state control of the means of production, the de-emphasis of the family unit, and the abolishment of religion. The terms socialism and communism are often used interchangeably. Early in the 20th century, Marxist ideologues began their crusade to impose communism on the world. To do so, they took over countries and imposed the meat grinder ideology of socialism on them to forcibly wring out class differences in their quest for the utopian ideal of communism. This brutal totalitarian campaign resulted in the deaths of millions of people. These are the victims of socialism. And now I'm going to tell you their tragic story. To begin, I'm going to read excerpts from an article titled, Can There Be an After Socialism? Written in 2003 by Alan Charles Coors, professor of history at the University of Pennsylvania. Coors wrote, no cause ever in the history of all mankind has produced more cold-blooded tyrants, more slaughtered innocents, and more orphans than socialism with power. It surpassed exponentially all other systems of production in turning out the dead. The bodies are all around us, and here is the problem. No one talks about them. No one honors them. No one does penance for them. No one has committed suicide for having been an apologist for those who did this to them. No one pays for them. No one is hunted down to account for them. It is exactly what Solzhenitsyn foresaw in the Gulag Archipelago. No, no one would have to answer. No one would be looked into. Continuing with Coors, we, to be moral beings, we must acknowledge these awful things appropriately and bear witness to the responsibilities of these most murderous times. Until socialism, like Nazism or fascism, confronted by the death camps, and the slaughter of innocents is confronted with its lived reality, the greatest atrocities of all recorded human life. We will not live after socialism. Again from Coors, it will not happen. The pathology of Western intellectuals has committed them to an adversarial relationship with the culture, free markets, and individual rights that has produced the greatest alleviation of suffering, the greatest liber liberation from want, ignorance, and superstition, and the greatest increase of bounty and opportunity in the history of all human life. This pathology allows Western intellectuals to step around the Everest of bodies of the victims of communism, 
without a tear, a scruple, a regret, an act of contrition, or a reevaluation of self, soul, and mind. Today we are going to tear the veneer off of the intellectual self-serving pathology and shine a bright light on the reality of the terror, death, and destruction inflicted on the world by the perpetrators of this hideous ideology. Again from Coors in his brilliant essay, we are surrounded by slain innocents and the scale is wholly new. This is not the thousands killed during the Inquisition. It is not the thousands of American lynching. This is not the six million dead from Nazi extermination. The best scholarship yields numbers that the mind must try to comprehend. Scores and scores and scores and scores of millions of bodies. The pictures you will see today are disturbing. Horrific as they may be, they are accurate images of the agonizing pain, suffering, and death inflicted upon these innocent victims of socialism. Sadly, there were literally thousands of pictures to pick from in compiling this presentation. Beyond the visceral horror conveyed in this small sample of imagery, this presentation will attempt to put into perspective the sheer staggering number of deaths caused by socialism. Churchill said, socialism is the philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance, and the gospel of envy. Its inherent virtue is the equal sharing of misery. Soviet socialism, based on the collectivist philosophies espoused by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, took hold in Russia after the October Revolution in 1917. Led by Vladimir Lenin, a vicious and ruthless ideologue, the victorious Bolsheviks set forth to fundamentally change Russia based on Marx's utopian vision of society. <laughs> Lenin and his fellow na socialists nationalized industries and confiscated private land and other property from its owners. Religion was officially eliminated from Russian society as Russians were forced at gunpoint to worship the power of the state. In order to firmly establish his new ideology, Lenin resorted to a campaign of mass murder of his political opponents in a purge now referred to as the Red Terror. It is estimated that upward of 1.5 million people were murdered during this brutal campaign. Lenin personally sent the orders to introduce terror and kill those who resisted the socialist takeover of Russia. This telegram is an example. Comrades, the Kulak uprising in your five districts must be crushed without pity. You must make example of these people. One, hang, I mean hang publicly so that people see it. At least 100 Kulaks, rich bastards and known bloodsuckers. Two, publish their names. Three, seize all of their grain. Four, single out the hostages per my instructions in yesterday's telegram. Do all this so that for miles around, see it, people see it all, understand it, tremble, and tell themselves that we are killing the bloodthirsty kulaks and that we will continue to do so. Doors, Lenin. As vicious as Lenin was, his successor as Secretary General, Joseph Stalin, was even worse. In 1929, Stalin ordered the forced removal of minor landowners and better off peasants, the kulaks from their farms, while simultaneously ordering the collectivization of Soviet agriculture. Under de-kulakization, millions of kulaks were executed or shipped off to re-education camps in the Arctic. Under collectivization, Stalin's socialist government confiscated all private farms and livestock. Surviving peasants were forced to work on collective farms run under strict government control. These two brutal measures resulted in millions of deaths, particularly among the deported kulaks. Soviet collectivization and dekulakization efforts were met with great resistance in Ukraine, a vast area populated by 40 million people situated between Moscow and the Black Sea. As a result of this resistance, the Ukrainian people became the target of Stalin's wrath. 
In 1932, Stalin imposed impossibly high grain quotas on Ukrainian collective farms and ordered the removal of every handful of food from the region. Secret police were ordered to arrest any peasant caught stealing even the smallest amount of food. Military blockades were erected to prevent food from entering the area and to prevent the hungry Ukrainians from leaving. Predictably, and as was intended by Stalin, these measures led to a horrific famine. Entire villages were wiped out, and in some areas the death rate exceeded one-third. Ukrainian countryside, home to some of the most fertile land on earth, was reduced to a silent wasteland. Somewhere between five and ten million innocent Ukrainians starved to death in a famine now referred to as the Holodomor. From 1936 to 38, in an attempt to consolidate and strengthen his power, Stalin conducted the Great Purge, also called the Great Terror. Unlike the previous socialist mass murders carried out in the countryside, the Great Purge was primarily directed at Communist Party members, government officials, and Red Army leadership. In this reign of terror, hundreds of thousands of victims were accused of various political crimes, including espionage, sabotage, anti-Soviet agitation, and conspiracies to conduct coups. Those accused were either summarily executed by shooting or sent to the labor camps. According to declassified Soviet archives, during 1937 to and 1938 alone, the Soviet secret police detained over 1.5 million people, of whom almost 700,000 were shot. Western scholars estimate that the actual number murdered was nearly twice this number. Stalin also presided over the vast expansion of the Soviet gulag system, the infamous forced labor and re-education camps run by the socialist regime. The gulag had a total inmate population of about 100,000 in the late 1920s when it underwent an enormous expansion, coinciding with Stalin's collectivization of agriculture. By 1936, the gulag held roughly five million prisoners, a number that was probably equaled or exceeded every subsequent year until Stalin died in 1953. Political prisoners, prisoners consisted of rich or resistant peasants arrested during collectivization, purged Communist Party members and military officers, suspected saboteurs and traitors, and dissident intellectuals. Prisoners entered the gulag in three major waves. In 1929 to 32, the years of collectivization of Soviet agriculture. In 1936 to 38, at the height of Stalin's great purge. And in the years immediately following World War II. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, perhaps the gulag's most famous inmate, claimed that be between 1928 and 1953, some 40 to 50 million people served long sentences in the archipelago. Figures supposedly compiled by the Gulag administra administration itself, released by Soviet historians in 1989, revealed that a total of 10 million people were sent to the camps from 1934 to 1947. Gulag prisoners lived under the threat of starvation or execution if they refused to work. It is estimated that as a result of long working hours, harsh climatic and working conditions, inadequate food and summary executions, at least 10% of the gulag's total prisoner population died each year. Given the gory mathematics, Western scholars have estimated that the number of deaths attributed to the gulag runs well into the millions. Solzhenitsyn wrote, socialism of any type leads to a total destruction of the human spirit and to a leveling of mankind into death. The Black Book of Communism, the authoritative reference source for the deadly statistics of communism, conservatively estimates that Soviet socialism led to the deaths of 20 million human beings. To put this in perspective, 20 million is roughly the entire current population of the state of New York. The magnitude of horror, death, and destruction brought about by Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin as they ruthlessly imposed socialism 
upon Russia and the Soviet Union is beyond human comprehension. As bad as the Russian people suffered under these two monsters, the Chinese people's descent into the hell of socialism was far worse. Mao Zedong was the greatest mass murderer of the 20th century. In 1949, as chairman of the Communist Party of China, Mao proclaimed the foundation of the People's Republic of China. He then set forth to impose his version of Marxism on the Chinese people. The results were catastrophic. Mao employed a familiar playbook in imposing socialism in China, the Great Leap Forward, launched by Mao in 1957, brought with it the forced collectivization of China's agricultural sector in an attempt to accelerate the growth of the country's industrial sector. Not surprisingly, the expropriation of private farms and with it the elimination of economic incentives to produce food led to famine and mass starvation. It is estimated that deaths from hunger alone reach more than 50% in some Chinese villages and ultimately 30 million to 40 million Chinese peasants perished, roughly the entire current population of the state of California. In 1968, the year before the United States first put a man on the moon, a young Chinese Red Guard who was being pursued in the countryside by the authorities took refuge in a village in Anhui where he heard many stories about the Great Leap Forward. He later wrote, we walked along beside the village. The rays of the sun shone on the jade green weeds that had sprung up between the earth walls, accentuating the contrast with the rice fields all around and adding to the desolation of the landscape. Before my eyes, among the weeds, rose up one of the scenes I had been told about, one of the banquets at which the family swapped children in order to eat them. I could see the worried faces of the families as they chewed the flesh of other people's children. The children who were chasing butterflies in a nearby field seemed to be the reincarnation of the children devoured by their parents. I felt sorry for the children, but not as sorry as I felt for their parents. What had made them swallow that human flesh amidst the tears and grief of other parents? Flesh that they would never have imagined tasting, even in their worst nightmares. In that moment, I understood what a butcher he had been the man whose like humanity has not seen in several centuries, and China not in several thousand years, Mao Zedong. In the mid-1960s, Mao came to the conclusion that current Chinese socialist leadership was moving too far in a revisionist, less ideologically pure direction. In response, in August 1966, Mao launched the Cultural Revolution. Schools were shut down, and Mao called for a massive youth movement to act against Communist Party leaders for their embrace of bourgeois values and lack of revolutionary zeal. Soon, student paramilitary groups called the Red Guards were formed, and they attacked and harassed members of China's elderly and intellectual populations. How ironic it is that the intellectual class was the target of Mao's bloodthirsty student brigades. Professors had their faces smeared with ink, were forced to get down on all fours and bark like dogs. Many were beaten to death, and some were eaten after being murdered. Mao, the so-called great helmsman, reveled in the bloodletting, boasting, what's so unusual about Emperor Shi Wang of the China dynasty? He had buried alive 460 scholars only. But we have buried alive 46,000 scholars. No microaggressor was he. Roughly 1.5 million souls were exterminated during the Cultural Revolution. Mao also established the Logai, a vast system of forced labor and re-education camps. Over 1,000 camps were established, and it is estimated that roughly 50 million people passed through these camps through the mid-1980s, with upwards of 80% of these being political prisoners. It is estimated that 20 million captives died while being imprisoned in this Chinese version of the Gulag. The Black Book of Communism estimates that Chinese socialism led to the deaths of 65 million people. 
That's the equivalent of the combined populations of California and Texas, our state's two most populous states. Think about that. Everyone living in Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, Houston, Dallas, plus so many, many more, dead. Perhaps no other country suffered more at the hands of its socialist masters than Cambodia. Pol Pot's murderous Khmer Rouge seized control of Cambodia in 1975, and they then set about to impose socialism on the Cambodian people. The country suffered horribly under the socialist brutal oppression until Pol Pot was ousted in 1979. Highly xenophobic, Pol Pot set about to completely isolate the country from outside influences and to establish a collectivist, radically agrarian society. To accomplish this, the regime closed all of the country's schools, hospitals, banks, and factories. Religion was outlawed and all private property confiscated. Most citizens in urban areas were forcibly relocated from their homes to work on the collective farms. The Khmer Rouge told these residents they would be moved only a short distance from home and that they would return after only a few days. People who refused to evacuate were killed on the spot and their homes burned to the ground. The evacuees were instead sent on long marches to the collectives during which tens of thousands of children, the elderly, and the sick died. Inevitably, the elimination of private economic incentives to grow food, coupled with government corruption and inefficiency, led to a horrific famine. Although, widespread, although death from starvation was widespread, acts such as picking wild fruit or berries were seen as private enterprise by the Khmer Rouge and punishable by death. Commercial fishing was banned, resulting in a loss of a primary food source for millions of Cambodians, 80% of whom relied on fish as their primary source of protein. To make way for Pol Pot's vision of an agrarian utopia, money was abolished, books were burned, and most of the country's murder teachers, merchants, and intellectual elite were murdered as they were viewed as potential enemies of the state. One need only be seen wearing eyeglasses to be branded as an intellectual and shot. Of course, in congruence with standard socialist protocol, all religion was banned. Anyone seen taking part in religious activities or services was summarily executed. Thousands of Buddhists, Muslims, and Christians were murdered simply for exercising their religious beliefs. Pol Pot and his Khmer Rouge brigades took power in Cambodia in order to create an agrarian communist utopia. Inevitably and tragically, the experiment ended just like every other experiment in socialism, a dreadful, deadly disaster. The Black Book of Communism estimates that, the, that Cambodian socialism led to the deaths of two million people, or roughly 25% of the country's population. That's roughly the entire current population of Chicago, Illinois. Today we have seen vivid images of the horror, destruction, and death inflicted in the 20th century by three socialist regimes. Sadly, many more experiments with this grotesque ideology dot the historical timeline of the 20th century, each without fail resulting in the same hideous result. We have been presented with numerical comparisons set forth to highlight the sheer magnitude of the number of people killed by these regimes. By any measure or comparison, the toll is absolutely staggering. To deny this, or to invoke the argument of capitalism's moral equivalence to socialism, is to engage in abject intellectual dishonesty. But there is one additional facet of this human tragedy that cannot go unmentioned, one that is infinitely more difficult to see or to quantify, this being the realization and recognition of the personal fear, horror, agony, and pain experienced by each of the millions of human souls 
vaporized by this ghastly ideology in the 20th century. Real blinking human eyeballs once filled the empty eye sockets of the dried out skulls, now stacked like cordwood, are the victims of the Khmer Rouge. These eyes belong to real people, human souls with special talents, loves, dreams, and aspirations. They belong to mothers, fathers, sisters and brothers, sons and daughters, human beings, just like all of us gathered here today. Just imagine the horror and sadness witnessed by these eyes. Just imagine the tears shed from them over a beloved child dying from starvation in his mother's arms. A friend being shot simply because she wore eyeglasses. An infant slammed to death against a tree in front of his agonized parents. And for what? To sustain an ideology that runs completely counter to human nature. An ideology that totally extinguishes human freedom and dignity and replaces it with forced allegiance to a totalitarian, all-powerful state. An ideology that, in the name of radical egalitarianism, brutally crushes any semblance of individual initiative or creativity. An ideology that must build walls to keep those subjected to it from fleeing. An ideology whose adherents believe that the end justifies the means, no matter how horrible both of these are. Make no mistake about it, the millions of deaths caused by these three socialist regimes were no accident, nor were they an unfortunate or unintended consequence of forced seismic changes in political and economic systems. Communism's goal of achieving utopian society with absolute enforced equality for all, is at such odds with human nature that it required the imposition of brutal and total control by the state over every aspect of the lives of those subjected to it. Those who resisted, those who des desired meritocracy, and those who dared to seek freedom had to be liquidated. How do we know this? How can we be so certain? because the architects of this evil ideology told us exactly what they intended to do. Lenin said, surely you do not imagine that we shall be victorious without applying the most cruel revolutionary terror? Stalin said, the death of one man is a tragedy. The death of millions is a statistic. Mao said, we are prepared to sacrifice 300 million Chinese for the victory of the World Revolution. Pol Pot said, he who protests is an enemy. He who opposes is a corpse. Fortunately, there were leaders in the West who recognized the moral rot underpinning socialism and who fought back. President Ronald Reagan, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, and Pope John Paul II each understood the monstrous nature of socialism. In one of the greatest triumphs of the 20th century, they worked together in the 1980s to undermine and defeat the Soviet Union's evil empire without firing a shot. In 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. In 1991, the Soviet Union dissolved and socialism in Eastern Europe collapsed. The free world rejoiced as nearly a billion people were freed from the shackles imposed by this repugnant ideology. Sadly, roughly 1.5 billion people in the world still live under oppressive socialist regimes in China, North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Cuba, and now before our eyes in Venezuela. One need not bother waiting for the tenured professors of Marxist studies teaching in America's colleges and universities to lecture about the fundamental inherent evils of socialism. Such critical thinking will not be forthcoming. As Professor Kors noted, their pathology allows them to step around the Everest of bodies of the victims of communism without a tear, a scruple, a regret, an act of contrition or a reevaluation of self, soul, and mind. 
Rather, the true story of socialism is understood and told best by other victims, not, not mentioned so far today. For you see, not all the victims of socialism perished in the killing fields of Cambodia. Not all are buried beneath the Siberian tundra, dragged lifeless there from a hellish gulag. Not all lie in mass graves dotting the Chinese countryside and in Eastern Europe. The other victims of socialism are those who survived this wicked system, those who risked their lives and the lives of their loved ones to escape from their socialist oppressors. Escapees from Cuba, boat people from Southeast Asia, former residents of Soviet-dominated Eastern Europe, refugees from ghastly socialist experiments in Africa, people who actually experienced and utterly rejected the horrific soul-crushing ideology of radical egalitarianism. Listen to them. Listen to their personal stories of socialist oppression. Take in the far-off looks in their eyes as they speak of the loved ones lost or left behind during their desperate and dangerous flights to freedom. Listen to their profound gratitude for and appreciation of the freedoms that most Americans take entirely for granted. Listen to these survivors, for only they can truly speak for the 94 million human souls sacrificed on the bloody, godless altar of socialism in the 20th century. In the next portion of the lecture, I'm going to share some thoughts about socialism within the context of the current political landscape in the United States. This slide shows a depiction of the p political spectrum as it is traditionally taught. This spectrum is flawed in two major respects. First, separating socialism from communism at the left side of the spectrum implies that socialism is a softer, less authoritarian, and more palatable ideology that communi than communism. As you learned earlier in this lecture, this is not the case. Socialism is the horrid, brutal ideology imposed to wring out all class distinction as society moves towards the classless, stateless utopia of communism. Second, the placement of fascism on the right side of the spectrum near con conservatism makes absolutely no sense, as we will see in the next slide. This misplacement is very unfortunate and perhaps deliberate, as it makes it easier for those on the left to brand conservatives as Nazis or fascists, a charge that is leveled every single day. Just ask Ben Shapiro. Let's now look at a different layout of the political spectrum, one that I believe is far more revealing. This spectrum measures several ideologies based on their level of freedom, ranging from 0% on the left-hand side to 100% on the right-hand side. Conversely, the level of government control moves from 1% to 0% as you move from left to right. Socialism and fascism, both relying on highly authoritarian control, populate the left-hand side of this spectrum. Moving to the right, we see the placement of the main political parties in the United States. At the far right is anarchy, with 100% freedom and zero state control. A closer look at some tenets of socialism and fascism justifies the close alignment of these two ideologies on this spectrum. Socialism and fascism are ideological cousins. Both require the establishment of totalitarian states, featuring no free elections, only one political party, complete state control of the economy, no organized labor rights, and limited or no religious freedom. Socialism seeks forced equality for all, while fascism seeks ethnic purity. To accomplish this, both ideologies sanction hatred. Socialists hate the upper classes, while fascists direct their hatred towards differing ethnic groups. The distinction between the two ideologies is blurred even further when it is noted that the term Nazi is a contraction of the term National Socialist. As the table shows, the differences between socialism, fascism, and capitalism are many. Capitalism is based on free markets, individual rights, political choice, free elections, minimal state control, and the freedom of religion. Think about this comparison next time you hear a socialist Antifa thug 
label a conservative a Nazi. In reality, that thug is much closer to being a Nazi than the conservative will ever be. Given the vile and horrific histories of both fascism and socialism, it is interesting to compare the vastly differing current perceptions of these two ideologies within today's political landscape. First, let's take a look at all the self-described fascist elected politicians in the United States. There are none. Given the evil nature of fascism, I think we can all agree that this is a good thing. Okay, let's take a look at some of the self-described socialist election, elected politicians in the United States. Bernie Sanders, U.S. Senator from Vermont, who nearly won the Democrat Party for nomination in 2016 and is running again in 2020. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, freshman member of Congress from New York and the primary author of the Green New Deal. Julia Salazar, New York State Senator, and there are more. The Democrat Party has moved distinctly to the left in recent months, so much so that the term socialist is no longer viewed as a pejorative by many within the mainstream of the party. But it is not just left-wingers in the Democrat Party that are becoming more accepting of socialism. The trend is even more widespread and ominous. The Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation a foundation created by the United States government in the 1990s to educate Americans about the brutal legacy of socialism, recently released the results of its annual report on U.S. attitudes towards socialism. The most startling finding that 52% of millennials would prefer to live in a socialist or communist country than a capitalist one. This is a tragic development. Why? Why is there such a difference in current societal perceptions of the twin pillars of evil, fascism and socialism? Beyond left-wing Hollywood's whitewash and mainstream media neglect, another reason for this is the failure of the U.S. education system to teach equally both the horror of fascism and the tragedy that is socialism. To my audience of high school students, it is likely that you have not been fully exposed to the true sad story of the victims of socialism until today. When you get to college, many of you will remain unexposed to the reality of socialism's failures. To the contrary, your campus will likely be a hotbed of leftist ideology with an affinity for praising the virtues of socialism and a strong proclivity to stifle any speech that defies this orthodoxy. I'm challenging you to remain active and true to your conservative values as you enter your college years. It will not be easy, as these values will, will be continually attacked and ridiculed by leftist university administrators, faculty members, and students. Be prepared to respond. When your professor tells you that the United States is a racist, oppressive nation, ask him to explain why it is then that the caravans of, caravans of migrants from Central America always make the long trek north to racist, oppressive America instead of making the relatively short march southeast to socialist, utopian Venezuela. When you hear a student claim that capitalism brings unhealthy levels of income inequality, mention that this freedom-fueled inequality is a far more righteous outcome than the lethal equality suffered by almost 100 million people under socialism in the 20th century. And while those atrocities were taking place, capitalist countries were achieving the highest level, highest standard of living in the history of the world. When you hear someone extolling the virtues of Cuba's health care system, remind them that no one in history has tried to sit on an inner tube and float from Key West to Havana, while hundreds have perished attempting to float the opposite way to freedom. When a classmate tells you that the rich don't pay their fair share of taxes, Point out to them that the top 3% of taxpayers in the United States pay over 50% of the nation's income tax bill and that the United States has one of the most progressive tax systems in the world. When you were told that socialism is a great idea in theory, respond that no, socialism is a terrible idea in theory, a horrible concept made much, much worse when actually implemented. Above all this, as you enter the fray, as a conservative, 
you are on the right side of history and on the moral side of righteousness, and that the facts will always bear this out. I'd like to conclude today's lecture by invoking one of Ronald Reagan's most famous quotes. Addressing the Phoenix Chamber of Commerce in March 1961, Reagan said this, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. Ladies and gentlemen, our current country's current political environment has me concerned that my generation has not heeded President Reagan's warning about the potential extinction of freedom. We have allowed the purveyors of an evil failed ideology to gain a beachhead in the American political landscape, and they are gaining momentum. Allowing them to take control of our great country would be catastrophic. But just when I'm convinced that my generation has failed, I get the opportunity to meet bright, young, principled conservatives like you. Your passion, commitment, intelligence, and desire to make a difference has renewed my hope for our great country. Because soon it will be your time to fight the good fight. It will be a tough battle against a formidable foe that is not constrained by morality or truthfulness. The complacency of others will be your biggest challenge. Use your activism to demonstrate to them what a socialist America would look like, and you will prevail. I hope and pray that my fast approaching sunset years will be spent not in a country where basic freedoms have been snuffed out, but rather in that place President Reagan envisioned, a shining city on a hill, a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. I'm counting on you as activists and future conservative leaders to help me fulfill this prayer. Before taking questions, I'd like to ask that we observe a moment of silence in memory of the millions of victims of socialism, past and present. At this time, I'd be delighted to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. students, we have time for a couple questions, so you know the drill. Please line up in the back. Our first question comes from Virtual Pass. Elizabeth in Buffalo would like to know, do you think progressives like AOC will ever take socialism to the level of danger that the Soviet Union did, or is it more of a nominal fad, which they don't understand what they're actually advocating for? And that, that's a great question. And a lot of the early record rhetoric would have led me to believe that she just simply did not know what she's talking about when she says she, she is a socialist and espouses socialist values. But then out comes the Green New Deal. And I encourage all of you to read the Green New Deal because it's not all about green. It's all about control. And it's not about necessarily the environment. It's about uh, free housing, income, free college, all these things that have nothing to do with um, the environment. So. Um, it's a great question. I don't know. I hope to heck that I never have to find out what uh, AOC and her ilk would do to this country if they ever gained control. Uh, my name is Drew Fatter from Classical Academy High School. And my question was, if Bernie Sanders or, say, AOC was elected president uh, this upcoming election, how far do you think socialism would get in this country, and would America be able to recover? Well, as I said in the presentation, it would be catastrophic. And I'm hoping that the American people would, first of all, resist. That seems to be a term the left is very comfortable with, 
but we need to resist. If that happens, um, I believe that the American people would find out very quickly what that would lead to, and they need look only down to um, what's gone on in Venezuela over the last 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan Lee. I'm from Ventura, California, and I go to El Camino High School. Hey, Megan. Um, hi. So when I was talking to um, someone else who goes to high school um, about socialism and the repercussions of socialism, I um, was telling them that millions of people have died from socialism, and he replied saying that many people have died in capitalism too. So how would you like respond to someone saying that? Well, you can point out that uh, eight of the ten largest famines in the history of the world took place in socialist countries, that uh, generally uh, capitalist countries, um, and, and by the way, pure capitalist country has never had a famine to the extent that would rise even to the top ten or top twenty, um, that the innovation that drives medical uh, developments, that drives agricultural developments, is a, in, it happens in free uh, capitalist societies. You know, what you'll hear from the left is, well, people don't have health care and therefore they'll, they'll die. And I, um, I, I don't think that that's happening in a material amount. So yes, you're right, you'll hear that. And I've actually been challenged when I've spoken. They put up signs wanting me to talk about the victims of capitalism. But capitalism is a kind, it sounds like a pejorative. It was really coined by the early Marxists. But it really just means freedom. That's all it means. When someone takes a shot at capitalism, they're taking a shot at freedom. So that's how I'd respond. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, hi, my name is Alex Gavin. I'm homeschooled through Inspire Charter Schools. Uh, why do you think, despite all this evidence of like mass like killings and murder and death, that socialists of today still think that it's going to work out and be a good idea? What is there, why do they think that is something? Well, I think part of the problem is, I mentioned in the presentation, they're, they're not taught this. So one of the earlier questions said, you know, they talked to a friend and talked about killing. It seemed like the, the person didn't know about it. So our education system is woeful in getting this uh, history and this horrifying history across. Um, then you'll also hear them say, that it's never really been tried correctly before. And um, I would say, I would just recite to them the definition of insanity because we've tried, people have tried this over and over again and it happens the same every time. And, and one thing, don't, don't let them tell you that what's going on in Scandinavia is socialism. It's not re remotely close. That's one lesson, okay, a lot of dead bodies, socialism's evil, but don't let them tell you that that's what's going on in Scandinavia, because that's absolutely wrong. Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name is Juana, and I go to Warren Township High School in Gurney, Illinois. And my question is, how do you tell people of color, or specifically Latinos, like, how do you explain to them and ingrain to them that socialism was bad? Like, even in my AP Spanish class, they'll have a big poster of Che Guevara, or they're praising people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and I think it is such an embarrassment, so what would you do? Well, I would try to ed educate them about Che, for one, and then YAF does a great job. I think it's about to happen, or they just had it, No More Che Day on campus. Che was a murderous thug and involved with the killing of hundreds of people without due process. Um, uh, I would point out to them that uh, why is it then if, if we're such a bad spot and freedom's bad, why, again, back to the migrants, why do they all want to come here? Why? Do they, why aren't they going to Venezuela where it's a socialist country? Why aren't they getting on boats and floating to Cuba? Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Christopher La Rochelle. I go to Colby Academy. San Diego, California, My and bear. do you think the only thing that's stopping USA from becoming a socialist country is guns and the conservatives that are here? Um, 
I would certainly, I wouldn't go far as far to say the guns yet, but I mean, who knows what could happen down the road. And that's certainly an issue that we're probably all aligned on is Second Amendment rights. And, um, I think that it's, it's a lot of people that, that aren't apathetic and aren't aware of what's going on. And I think it's also, yeah, it's conservatives. It's people that get it. It's young people like you. I was telling one of the folks, my yeah, friends, I get so despondent at times seeing what's going on in the world and then I come to a conference like this and I get energized because you guys are going to be the ones to carry the ball and you're bright and you get it and you understand the concepts. I didn't. When I was your age, I was a mushhead. And um, uh, so I think, yes, I think conservatives and conservative values will hopefully carry the day um, as this fight continues. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carson Wright. I'm from Ellensburg High School in hey, Washington Carson. State. Um, what is your best argument uh, that you've made about socialism being way worse than capitalism? Why? What's your best argument against it? 100 million people dead. Uh, people uh, being walled in, trying to get out, risking their lives and the lives of their families to get on boats and float across the ocean cut through barbed wires in going from East Berlin to West Berlin. Um, freedom. And, and you know, just think about it. And you'll hear this on, comp on campus, and I mentioned it in one of the slides. You'll hear people tell you, well, socialism, that's a great idea. We just can't figure it out. But I, I challenge you to sit back and think about the tenets of socialism and con convince yourself, please, that it's a horrible idea. You know, everyone shares, no matter what you do, there's no individuality, and um, I, I think it's just, and government, complete government control to make sure that happens. Thank you. Okay. Hello, I'm Jack Roper, and I homeschool, but I take a lot of my classes at Palomar College. It's a junior college in San Diego. Um, so before I ask my question, I, I did want to say thank you very much for speaking about this. Um, my great-great-grandmother lived in Ottoman Armenia, and she had to escape because of all the killings that happened there, and it just disgusts me when people talk about socialism as such a wonderful thing. So my question was, um, I noticed a trend of the more structure you have in a society, the more um, it can hurt people and cause mass killings like this. So is there a true perfect uh, amount of structure in a country? Um, well, I think that for years our country was the, the closest you can get. You know, we're a, a, a republic, and don't forget that. We're not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic with limited government. And, and one of the other speakers mentioned it too. It's a government is not there to give you stuff or give you rights. It's to protect your rights. and. Um, I would say that you know, our, our country hasn't had a perfect history, but that concept as laid out by our founding fathers is as perfect as you're ever going to find. I'm, can I make one other, just one minute? Okay, so I expect to get this question and I didn't. And I'll just walk through. This concept of democratic socialism, oh, maybe, okay. So let's play, I expect to get, well, what about democratic socialism? How many of you heard this term, right? Well, let's play this game called democratic fill in the blank. First one is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Okay, that sounds like that great uh, country on, um, in the southern part of the Korean Peninsula that has somewhat of a capitalist country. Well, no, that's not. That is socialist North Korea the world's most repressive country. You'll see the word democratic in the front. Here's another one, democratic Kampuchea. Now that sounds like a tranquil, charming little democratic country, doesn't it? It's a great place to go on vacation. That's Pol Pot socialist Cambodia. And finally, here's the third, and there's other examples. This concept is the people's democratic dictatorship. Well, that dictatorship word seems kind of ominous, but it's okay because we have socialists or democratic uh, as um, uh, part of the name. 
And uh, this was actually a phrase that Chairman Mao added to the Chinese Constitution. So what do you now do you think of the term democratic socialism? So keep that in mind, you'll hear that. So you want your safe space. The last thing you want is somebody invading your campus. You should always feel like you're right. Freedom is not an abstraction. It affects our happiness and our ability to flourish. It is very seldom that liberty of any kind is lost all at once. It's always lost bit by bit. We have protection of freedom of speech. If we said only things that other people liked, we'd have no reason to protect it. Notice that when Jefferson looks for a source of our rights, we can only find one, and that's the creator. We are a country that respects religious liberty. That key value has been enshrined in our founding documents. We are created equal in the eyes of God, the core principle of democracy. To believe that Islam is a religion of peace is to believe that Muslims throughout history have misunderstood their own religion. Life is the most fundamental right. None of the other rights that are listed in the Bill of Rights actually exist without first the right to life. Free markets fundamentally run on service, not to make everyone's outcomes equal. We are diverse people with diverse skills and diverse talents. Femininity is one of the graces of our world, one of the things that makes life worth living. Feminism has sucked all the joy out of that. They've attacked manliness itself. They've attacked the virtues. Virtue comes from vir, means man. To pretend that a man is a woman, if he believes he is a woman, nobody should be mistreated. But that's not the same thing as requiring that people say objectively untrue things. If I believe I am something that I am not, it does not make me that thing.